At 28.2% of employees, Ontario has the second lowest unionization rate in Canada. And of course, less and less of that unionized workforce is in the private sector. What does the labor movement need to do to broaden its appeal? Joining us now to help answer that, Yasser Nakvi. He's Ontario's Minister of Labor and the MPP for Ottawa Centre. Glenn Wheeler, legal counsel for COPE, the Canadian Office and Professional Employees Union. Kelly McParlin, columnist with the National Post. And Jenny Ahn, who's the assistant to the national president with Unifor, which used to be, let me get this right, the Canadian Auto Workers and CEP, Communications Energy Paper Workers. And then you made the big merger back on Labor Day, and now you're Unifor. That's correct. i got to get used to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I should get used to that because everybody taking your picture here today is with Unifor. We're very happy with that. Okay. <laughs> uh, folks, welcome to the broadcast. It's nice to have you here tonight. Let us, um, let's start with this. Jenny, to you first. Why, at this moment in the union movement's history, do you feel, if you do, that unions need to, in some respects, reinvent themselves? Well, I think that unions should always reinvent themselves, always be relevant. So if we weren't, like any other business or any other community organization, then we wouldn't be relevant. So if we were to say, let's not do anything and let's do the same thing over and over again, then we would be obsolete and irrelevant. So as Unifor, uh, the, the formation of Unifor was about that, you know, bringing two large unions together to say, hey, how can we do things differently? How can we make ourselves more relevant? How do we reach out to more different workers of all different demographics right across this country in every sector? So this is about being more relevant and being able to do things new and differently. Kelly, does the union movement need to reinvent itself for the 21st century? I think definitely. It was interesting to hear what Jenny said because I was going to say that, that what unions don't do is, is continually change. I mean, I've been working for almost 40 years now. Everything in my business has changed. Everybody knows that completely. You know, the newspaper business barely resembles what it did even 20 years ago. But when I look at, at uh, union websites and their constitutions, of which I have one here, um, it reads exactly like it did when I was 20. It's still about, you know, big, greedy, power-hungry corporations and, and dirty bankers crushing the little man. And I just, I don't really think that's what bankers do all day. And I don't think that's what corporations do all day. And I, and I think unions would really do themselves a favor by getting over that and changing with the work environment. Because the work environment changes. You can't stop it. It's going to change. You have to change with it. But, you know, I think they've got to change the attitude so they have. at the very least, modernize the language or the sense? Well, I don't think the language is enough, enough because that represents the attitude and that filters down the way they treat uh, the workplace, the people they're trying to sign up, and their attitude to management. And I just think you've got to get over this confrontational attitude that it's always us versus them and it's our way or strike. It's not always like that, but still, that kind of language reflects that kind of attitude. Okay. You know? Jenny wants to get back, but lots of time to respond as we go through. She's Glenn, how about your take on that? <laughs> I think unions do have to reinvent themselves. Uh, we live in a very individualistic uh, era, and our our language and references to the collective, collective bargaining, solidarity, are a bit alien to uh, a generation of, uh, uh, of where the it's about me, it's about uh, individual uh, power via the internet. So uh, I think we have to speak a new vocabulary. Okay. Minister. So, I, I mean, I think you, you see a bit of unanimity that any organizations, any institutions need to uh, keep up with time and recreate themselves. Question is, what's the role for the government in, in all that? And I think from, from, a, from a government point of view, ensuring is that there's balanced labor relations, that you've got a jurisdiction which uh, helps promote, uh, promote uh, a balance between employee groups, unions, uh, and, and, and representing those collective point of views. And of course, uh, employers, because in, in the end of the day, you want to make sure you've got a productive workplace uh, where uh, workers uh, are in, in a, a good place to work, getting good wages, and of course, health and safety is paramount, and both employer and employees uh, or unions on their behalf working together. So that's, that has to be the aim for government, always to make sure that there is balanced labor relations in the province. You said something interesting, actually, before we went on the air about that, and it is the difference between a two-letter word and a three-letter word in your title. You said you're the minister of labor, not for labor. What's the difference? Well, the difference is, is making sure that there's balance, making sure that uh, there, it's a productive workplace 
uh, for, for everyone. I think in the end of the day, what governments are, are focused on is to make sure the economy is growing, that economy remains productive, that people are getting uh, uh, good, ba good wages and, and benefits. And the best way to do, to do that, and I see that daily in the role what the Ministry of Labor plays, is to be that, that arbitrator, to be there when, it, when there is a strike or lockout, to be able to facilitate conversations between the two parties and get them to come to a settlement agreement. So the, the balance part is, uh, is very important. Uh, and hence, I think the difference in title that as Minister of Labor, your job is to make sure that uh, uh, labor is healthy, labor has uh, good paying jobs, and both employers Although, and employees are working together. You know what she'd say, which is, sorry to put words in your mouth here, but she'd say probably everybody else in cabinet is the minister for business, so why can't you be the minister for labor? Well, I, again, I think uh, I think everybody uh, wants to make sure that there is uh, uh, the balance is key because the, the point one has to remember is is the the role of a minister of labor. The role of the minister of labor is to make sure that the systems in place uh, that is uh, collective bargaining takes place in a fair manner, where both parties can work together, negotiate, and come to a settlement. Those are the best agreements. You don't want a third party interfering in that process. So that's why the Ministry of Labor's uh, role, and, and these folks will tell you in, in a difficult negotiation, is to provide that neutral uh, mediation or conciliation Which services. Which is why you can't be the Minister for Labor, you gotta be up. You gotta got be, it. yeah. Jenny, let me give you a chance to go back at Kelly here on his initial comments that a lot of your language reflects a mindset that is 100 years out of date. What's your view on that? Well, it's still the same language. It's in English, so I don't think it's actually changed. I do think that there is a, uh, a different sense of how we can do things, and I think that, that that was happening even before the creation of Unifor. Approximately 97% of our collective agreements, for example, are settled without a strike or a lockout. But what we hear most often in the mainstream media is the pictures of, of, of workers going out on strike, which is very rare when you think of the statistics right across the country and in this province. But of course, there is a stereotype, there is a portrayal. But when you come out uh, into a union function and different things, yes, there are some traditional words that may be used, but it is changing. We're not, uh, you know, ignorant of, of who our members are and, and how things are changing. That we are looking at new technology, for example, demographics are changing, diversity within our membership is changing because it's obviously reflective of the population. Remember, unions don't pick our own members, it's the employers that hire that end up becoming union members. And there is no need for confrontation. Um, we don't advocate for confrontation unless it's, it's needed. And sometimes, you know, maybe cooler heads need to prevail, but it's often because there are great things at, stakes, at stake. You know, when you're talking about wages and benefits, for workers to have the ability to put food on the table, to pay their rent or their mortgages and things like that, then these are big stakes issues that often, if, uh, if there are problems, then people will get confrontational. Okay. Let me but get, generally they don't. I let me say. follow up with Kelly and as we bring the conversation from, say, the language of a long time ago to last week. Two by-elections in the province last week. Conservatives winning one in Thornhill, NDP winning one in Niagara Falls. Do you think the outcome of those two by-elections uh, may have some influence on the conversation about unions in Ontario today? You know what, I always think by-elections don't mean all that much. I think they're so specific to the situation and, and to often to local situations that I don't know how much I reflect on that. Something else that happened last week that I do think was interesting was a vote in Tennessee uh, where the United Auto Workers were trying to unionize the Volkswagen plant. Now that was the number one priority. And they voted no. They voted no. Number one priority of the, of the president of the UAW spent years trying to do that. They voted no. And when they, when they talked to the workers after that and they said, why did you vote no? Because most of them had signed the cards pre previously. A lot of them said, because we were afraid it would, uh, it would uh, hurt the, uh, the culture of the, of the workplace. It would become more confrontational, more aggressive. And they were worried about Detroit. They said, we looked at Detroit. We saw what happened there. Unions were there. It wasn't entirely their fault in Detroit, but they were certainly there. And I think that reflects what people think of unions. I'm sure unions try to change. They want, you know, obviously want to do their best for the, for the worker. But that attitude is there, and people see it. I think a lot of people are afraid of I'm unions. I'm not sure, Steve, that, uh, that the U.S. South is, a, is an analogy for, uh, for Ontario. And I think the interesting thing, one of the interesting things about uh, Mr. Hudak's uh, problems is that uh, there isn't a lot of corporate support. There isn't... Uh, uh, I don't see corporations uh, uh, coming out of the woodwork to stand uh, and support uh, uh, Mr. Hudak's uh, legislation, which I, I think is 
uh, indicative of the fact that um, we have a, uh, a stable uh, industrial relations environment in Ontario. Uh, we, we've gone through uh, periods of turmoil in our recent history. And we, I think we need a little background here, though, because you, you just introduced something without really explaining what it is. You're talking about the opposition leader, Tim Hudak, who, as a part of one of his, I think, 15 or 16 discussion papers, advanced an idea which has some similarities to the so-called right-to-work movement in the United States. Yes. Fair enough? Mm hmm Okay. And you think that's not going to fly here? Um, no. I, I think he, it, it, even in his own caucus, we know that uh, there is some resistance. Um, there isn't a lot of uh, positive reinforcement from the natural allies of such a, of such a bill, i.e. business, employers. Um, and people... Uh, don't want uh, the kind of upheaval uh, that would uh, inevitably follow um, such uh, legislation. But with a politician here, let me get to, it, to the political angle, because I just want to touch on the by-elections a bit. You know that part of the allegation is that you guys lost Niagara Falls and the NDP won it because the union movement has an ability in a by-election atmosphere to just pounce on a single riding, bring a lot of resources and person power to bear, people power, whatever the expression is, and win. Is that what happened? Well, I'm a firm believer in democracy, and in the end of the day, people decide. Uh, and, and people in Niagara Falls decided uh, to vote for one candidate over the other two candidates. And you can cut that into different, uh, any different way as to why that happened. But is people, it a reflection of union power? Uh, and people were involved uh, in, that, in that particular campaign, and uh, there could have been many reasons why uh, they, uh, they, elected, uh, uh, they elected Mr. Wayne Gates, who I look forward to, to working with. But I think one of the key issues, and, and the issue was, I think, was real in, in Niagara Falls, is around, around the idea of right to work for less, and whether this is something is needed in Ontario or not. Uh, Mr. Hudak continues to advocate uh, for it, and I want to correct uh, you, Steve, that it's not just one of 15 ideas that he has floated in one of his thinking paper. They actually have a private member's bill, tabled, Bill 64, by their labor critic then, Randy Hillier, who was at that time a labor critic, has a bill in the House which has all the elements of right to work for less policies in place. So this is not uh, just a, a thinking on their part. This is something they've actually now documented, and this is the second time uh, that bill is, is tabled in the House, and we'll see if, if it's ever get debated as a private member's bill. So this is a real intention on their part, uh, which well, is going to well, impact... Can I interrupt you for a second? W would you agree that, that the Million Jobs Act is really their statement about where they want to see labor relations go in the province in terms of job creation, that, that that's the leader's bill as opposed to a, a backbencher's bill? That's where they're at. Well, the backbencher was their labor critic. Was. But when he tabled it, he was the labor critic. Right. So, so I think it has... It has meaning. Uh, he stood in the House as the Labour critic for the official opposition, the Conservatives, and said, uh, you know, we want to change the Labour Relations Act in Ontario uh, uh, to bring right to work type policies in place, which we know from experience from the United States uh, has a significant impo impact on job creation. It, uh, it results in, in fact, net loss of jobs if you look at uh, states like uh, uh, South Carolina. Uh, but also results in weakened health and safety uh, laws as well. And we've got some data from, uh, from the Labor Bureau in U.S. which shows that the number of fatalities in workplaces is higher in right to work for less uh, states. There, there will be some people, forgive me, Jenny, I just want to do some business here because there will be some people asking right now, how come you haven't got a conservative out here debating Minister Nakvi on all of this? And the answer is, uh, we tried, but uh, we're told they weren't available. So that's why. You were going to say, forgive me. Well, I just wanted to clarify the, the terminology used by Hudak and the Conservatives of rights, at, uh, uh, rights to work. It has really nothing to do about rights to work. It really is about differences of ideologies, of, being, of, of workers having the opportunity to decide to have a democratic voice to join a union or not to have a union. Um, we are, are saying that there are lots of things that we can discuss about having better rights at work. And similar to what the minister is saying, if you look at U.S. statistics, 30% of non-unionized workers in the U.S. have a higher chance of fatalities in this day and age. That is just unbelievable in, in 2014 that people are still having that much of a difference between coming home safe and sound and alive if you have a unionized job 
or a 30% greater chance of a fatality. And, and I just say that's unacceptable. And those are the kind of conversations that we want to have as Unifor, as a labor movement, to represent workers and say, what do we want to see in the workplace, in our society today? And how do we reach out to have that kind of conversation and say, this is not about rights um, in the workplace, uh, according to Tim Hudak. Glenn, I want you uh, just to... Well, we've got some numbers here from the Canadian Labour Congress that I want to just read out to you and then have you react to this if you would, because the CLC reviewed some StatsCan numbers from last November, the Canadian Labour Force Survey, and they found that in the 15 to 24 age group, official unemployment stands at 13.4%. Almost half of young workers were employed only part-time in November. In the past 12 months, 40% of the new jobs have been part-time, and part-time workers now represent 19% of the total workforce. Do you think the union movement has played a role in those numbers being what they are? Well, there are two things to say about that. I think the, um, the, the deterioration in circumstance for, for young workers is in some way related to the, um, to the uh, declining influence of unions. Uh, one doesn't want to draw a direct connection, a causal connection. Many things are true at the same time. But I think many people would agree that because unions don't have the political clout they once did, that um, we have, uh, it's partly to do with, with that situation. The other thing I would say is that if you ask many of these workers um, if unions are the answer to their problem, many would say no. Okay. So we have a disconnect. Because I think uh, young workers uh, look at unions and see unions a little bit like the employer. They are part of some, um, uh, some special group, um, a little bit uh, uh, alien to them in terms of, uh, of age, maybe outlook. Um, and of course, we have to remember that in many collective agreements now, we have two-tiered systems. So though, even if those young workers came into a unionized environment, chances are they might have a, a different pension plan, an RSP plan, uh, as opposed to a, uh, you know, a regular pension plan. Um, and um, and, we, and we, don't, uh, we don't reach out to them um, in ways that uh, they're used to being reached out to. They're more often uh, like, likely to get a pamphlet than a, uh, a Facebook uh, message. I, I want to follow up on that younger thing, and I'm jumping ahead a bit here, Sheldon, so forgive me here. I'm at the bottom of page three. I wonder if we can bring that graphic up now, because you've talked about the hearts and minds of young people and how young people don't see unions as being part of their job guarantors. And look at this, uh, union density among workers is 15 to 24, uh, ages, sorry, 15 to 24, is up two percentage points since 1997. There's been an increase of 116,000 unionized workers, 15 to 24 in Canada since 1997. The median age of a unionized worker in 2013 was between 40 and 44, which is only slightly older than the overall labor force median age of 40. Young people don't see the union movement as being I don't know what, there for them? Well, I'm Is that fair to say? I'm going to respectfully disagree sure, go ahead. Uh, with Glenn here. I think that um, unions have to use new technology like everybody else. So whether it's social media, you know, Facebook, Twitter, texting, whatever it is. And we are doing that. Um, so yes, we do some of the traditional ways of reaching out using pamphlets and different things. But we also do use new media. Um, I do think that young people get it, but um, you know we're in a new challenging era where where young folks are used to sound bites, so not long explanations and uh, long debates per se. So we've got to get our message in a shorter period of time, and not everything can be explained in a short sound bite. So I think we recognize some of these challenges. So it's up for us to kind of figure out how do we better reach out? Could we, we do better? Absolutely, we could do better. Uh, but I do think that young folks uh, do recognize it, but you know what, I'm not sure it's the unions are, uh, are to blame for what's changing in the culture of employment and, and job situations. We are see, seeing more uh, part-time workers. Uh, we are seeing that young folks who may have been in the service or retail sector competing with older workers now. Because the, again, the nature of work has changed so much. Older workers don't all have full-time jobs anymore. So you're in this competition where in decades before, young folks would start off in a retail job and then move on to most likely full-time employment. And I don't think that's happening today. So okay. there is a bit of a 
you know, some tough, some tough uh, uh, life ahead of young folks saying, how can I make my improvements? But did you know, for young workers who belong in a unionized workplace, they can make almost $6 more an hour. It's about $5.53 uh, cents across the country. So for young workers, if you want to make a difference, I say see if there is interest to join a union because you could make better wages and hopefully uh, a pen, a benefits was, as well. If that was the case though, why aren't the young workers beating down the doors to get in? Why do you have to go out there and, and get them? Why do you need Facebook and all those other situations? If I think the, the figure used at the beginning was 27 or 28 percent membership in mm -hmm. Ontario in unions, if it's that low and you're having to drag them in, if the situation is as bad as described, you know, the economy and, and the, the banks and everybody out to get them, they should be coming to you. They should be lined up outside so the door. Why do you think young people are less interested in joining a union today? Because of what I said at the beginning, I don't think the unions have changed in 80 years. I think that they're still in the same mindset. They're still arguing the same arguments. I don't think that they reflect the changes that have taken place in the workforce. You know, I think the kind of people that run the unions are the same kind of people that have always run the unions, they tend to be, I mean, people don't get to the top till they're older, but they tend to be older, a certain demographic. I don't think that they really understand quite often the people that they represent. Um, and you can see it still because uh, uh, management labor uh, uh, relations are still pretty much as they've always been. It's, you know, we go into these negotiations, we talk about, you know, toilet breaks and this kind of stuff. How many kids that have been raised on a computer are concerned about, about uh, toilet breaks or arbitration or, or grievance procedures. I just don't think that it relates at all to this generation. Can I ask you, have you ever belonged to a union? No, I have, no, I have not. Because you're, you're one of the youngest guys in the legislature, mm -hmm. so you're kind of of that new generation, yeah. if I can put it that way. Do you think union membership speaks to people who are your age or younger? Well, so, I mean, anecdotally speaking, uh, talking to, uh, to, to my friends uh, who belong to union, I mean, not belong to union, I think th there is an element for taking it for granted, all right? A lot has been done. A lot of the heavy lifting uh, has, has been uh, done in the, in the past by, by previous generations. So there is that element that uh, people just take all, all the benefits they have or a pension they may have. Uh, for granted, so that's one challenge. And my, my analogy I will use, something similar, is political parties, right? We've had this conversation before. We see the same notions where young people do not want to get involved in organized political party. They don't want to uh, be more engaged in running for public office at any level or be out there volunteering in a campaign. You, you see the similar, uh, similar challenges there, and I think part of the reason is the society is changing, and. Uh, you know, we are well, getting the, more busier and busier with different yeah, things that we I do. but I see more kids getting involved in provincial or federal or municipal politics than I do in union politics. I just do. There's something about the union move, and I don't know, maybe this is a part of it. Let See, me before, read this. Before, no, 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 hang on. You know what? I want to quote you to you. Because you did a piece in the Toronto Star about this, and I wonder whether this is part of the explanation. I'm going to read a, a little excerpt from your article here and then get you to comment. Certainly, seniority is sacred among union militants, but the principle doesn't sit nearly as well with a generation raised on the importance of individual merit. Rather than something to cherish, younger workers see seniority-based promotion as the root of union-fostered unfairness that rewards oldsters who get the gig merely by sticking around. Is that part of it? It is part of it. Um, I think that um, obviously seniority uh, is one of our, our core values. It doesn't translate very well. Um, because it's based on a time when people would uh, have how many jobs during their lifetime? Maybe one, two, three. Now um, people don't stick around for the gold watch. Uh, they look ahead at their working life and think that I'll be in this job four years, I'll be in another job five years. It's a different environment, so there isn't the same investment in a position, and seniority um, doesn't play the same role in, in modern working life as it did in industrial uh, life of, uh, of decades ago, um, where it, it was developed. Jenny, how do you convince a 25-year-old that you care as much about her future in the union movement when push comes to shove, seniority means you're always going to favor the worker who's 30 years older than her? Well, I'm going to um, say, hey, I was one of those uh, young folks. Uh, I got involved in the, in the union um, in my early 20s. I got elected into the union when I was 24. And uh, I think that we are um, devaluing what young people think. I do think that young people uh, care about one another. There is a respectfulness 
of looking out for those who have been there before, for elders and, and things like that. I think that seniority is one of the basic principles, but you don't have to be an oldster. I mean, I guess then I'm considered an oldster. And I'm, let's just say without saying the age, probably in the same bracket as the minister here. And, um, and okay. the thing is, is that, hey, Are you this 40 is, yet? 41 now. You're 41. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> might be bang on actually. Okay. Um, so I mean, I'm one of these young people that got involved and I think that there is a mutual respect for knowing if someone's been there before. Being in, in a position also means that you've had the experience. So you could be in varying age groups, uh, not saying that you have to be old. I also want to challenge our system in saying, why is it okay that people think that I'm only going to work in one workplace for three, four years? Why can't we have some hope out there that says, hey, I like where I'm working. Why should the company have to retrain new people constantly spending money unnecessarily? If I've got a good worker, let's keep that person here and keep that person working for a longer period of time, uh, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, so on. And I think there, there is something wrong in the nature of work that we should say that is unacceptable. And how do we change that rather than saying, hey, this is the way it is now? I'm going to ask a cheeky question of Kelly over here. What's your wife do for a living? She's a teacher. Unionized? Yes. Which board? Uh, Catholic teachers union. Okay, Elementary she's, she's OECTA. Ontario English Catholic teachers? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Does she like sovereignty? Uh, I was going to say sovereignty. Uh, <laughs> that's another issue. <laughs> it's a little Freudian slip there. <laughs> Seniority? Um, you know what? I'm, I, I doubt it, um, although she benefits from it. Um, but it is hard to defend. I mean, it's one of those things that if you're one of the lucky people who's benefiting from it, it sounds great. Um, but you also see people that you work with who are younger and maybe deserve a better uh, to move up faster. And you know they're not going to. And, you know, I think a lot of union members, a lot of teachers are aware of the restrictions um, that are on people in their, in their uh, professions that come from being a member of a union. You know, you, you gain certain benefits, but you give up a lot for that. Seniority means that a bad teacher can be a bad teacher for a long time, and it's hard to get rid of them. Although, there's more flexibility in the system than people usually allow for. I mean, mm -hmm. principals know how to get rid of bad people. What's um, your view on seniority as a means of, you know, obviously seniority has its place, but there are more people, it seems to me, who are arguing today that seniority is more important than merit in the union movement, and that's a problem for those people. Well, again, I think this is uh, this is something that uh, that needs to be decided within within the union movement. Um, also, this is an important part of collective agreement when you, when you're looking at uh, benefits uh, uh, down the road or who will get uh, what not. I mean, until that long ago, we never thought we will see uh, two tier bargaining uh, that we will see uh, collective agreements uh, uh, differentiating between. Uh, somebody who's been there for some time and somebody c coming in uh, new and we're starting to see that evolution and so I mean unions are I think evolving unions are starting to recognize that there's a different reality. Well, what if Kathleen Wynne said I'm going to decide who's in my cabinet on the basis of who's got the most number of elections under their belt at Queen's Park? You'd never get in because there's always going to be people who well certainly in that caucus down there there's lots of people who've got more experience than you. Is that the, is, should that be the prime metric by which we determine who gets a job and who doesn't. I don't know if that's that's an apple to apple comparison. Uh, to, to I mean, where you've got a system, as in political system, where one person has all the discretion, uh, she has all the power uh, by the virtue of the fact that she's she's the premier or, or leader in in the in the house, and she can make those type of decisions. And in, even in in practical sense, she will never be able to exercise that decision because you know there's a lot of other forces in in place. So I am not sure. That the analogy that you are presenting compared to seniority as it exists within within uh, collective bargaining type of situation uh, is really uh, is really uh, the right analogy. Uh, again, this is this is the kind of things I think the unions are starting to look at. Uh, they're starting to to consider uh, within their fold, and it's starting. To, we are starting to see that reflected in their collective bargaining uh, positions. And maybe seniority wouldn't be such a, a big issue if uh, older workers had better paying jobs, a decent pension, so that they could retire in dignity. But what we're seeing is older people staying longer, 
Um, in this situation with teachers, for example, they may retire or they may have to come back, work part-time, may have to supply, teach, and other things like that. If our seniors, our older workers, were able to retire with a good pension, with dignity and respect, then they would have more positions for the younger people to take those jobs. I'm glad you, I'm glad you raised that because I want to I want, I ask you something based on that because it, it seems to me we've gone from what it once was in this province, which was boy, they've sure got a great pension. I want one of those too. Two, boy, they've sure got a great pension, and that's not fair, so let's take it away. When did we go from my first example to the second example? Well, because uh, it feels like that's where we're at right now. I think there's, I, I think there is that uh, animosity. Uh, rather than uh, wanting to bring us all up to that better level, um, we look at uh, those who have it better than us with, with some resentment. Um, and uh, and that's, that's a problem for, for unions because uh, we are often seen to be uh, the agents of those who already have it pretty good, um, which, is not the, which is not the reality. We have many people in, uh, in very, modest, uh, very modest jobs. Um, and um, so it's a, a bit of a caricature uh, of the reality, but it is it is a um, it is a an impression out there, and the fact that there is the impression means that there is a problem for us, whether it's true or not. Do you think it's true? I think that um, when that changed was when people began to realize that it was not sustainable to provide those those pensions. I think everybody would love one. Obviously, who wouldn't want one? Um, but in the private sector, at least, we realize that because. Economies are unpredictable because funny things happen to them, because people who manage pensions aren't always as smart as they should be and don't always make the best bets. Uh, quite often you pay into something for a long period of time and at the end you don't get what you expected to happen. Mm -hmm. The companies couldn't afford it and so they can go bankrupt as a result. That doesn't happen in the public sector because the taxpayer pays for it. And I think that's where the resentment comes from. I don't think it's because people dislike people who have a good job or a good pension. It's because they realize they're paying for somebody else to have something that they can't possibly have themselves. And I think that needs to be balanced. I think the, the public sector needs to recognize that, that not everybody uh, can afford what, what they've been uh, lucky enough to receive. Do you Perhaps. recognize that? And I think that's why we have to resist the temptation of having the conversation, which is us versus them, you know, going for that, the, that the, uh, the sort of the low wage economy where or going for the, the lowest denominator versus building things up. And I think this is one of the bigger bigger challenges uh, that uh, I and the government has with the right to work for less because it really sort of uh, takes you down to a point where everybody's competing for those, those low wages as opposed to saying, you know what, let's invest uh, in, in our society, let's invest in, in good skill sets, uh, let's make sure that everybody uh, gets good wages, uh, good, good benefits. That's a different way of building an economy versus uh, uh, let's let's uh, you know take away people's rights from a from a from a unionized workplace or, or otherwise, uh, and then you you are competing with the likes of in Indiana and and North Carolina sure. because it may be today because what tomorrow for the same low wage economy will be competing with India and China. Okay, I mean, let me just I want to make sure I understand here. So y your position is going forward, the government of, if if going to be an election in the spring probably. If you win the election, a Kathleen Wynne government would never put new hires in the public service on defined contribution pensions, it will always be defined benefit pensions. Well, yes? I, well I, again, I can't speak to as to what maybe the terms for, for negotiations uh, uh, may be, but I think the, 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 the point is that the point is that there is an, 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 a narrative right now in, in, our, in our province, and it may be true across the country, but I can speak for Ontario, where I think people are saying, well, you have a pension and I, I don't. And uh, instead of saying, I want to have a pension as well, be it defined contribution or defined benefit, uh, the, the conversation that's been geared towards, especially by the conservatives, is uh, let's make sure the other guy does not have that, that the same kind of pension. And I think that's, that's a false direction to go in as opposed that's to looking the, at... Well, with respect, that's half the conversation. Part, part of what they're saying also is any new hires in the public service get a pension, but they don't get the A1 pension that people have been getting up until now because we can't afford those anymore. We're going to get the B2 pensions, if you like, right? Defined contribution as opposed to defined benefit. Are you saying that the Liberal Party, in disagreeing with that, stands for the A1 pension going forward? 
Well, I th what, what I'm going to say is that we want to make sure that, we, of course, we are always operating within our fiscal means. And that's always important point in, in, any, in any place where you're negotiating. So you with may agree future. with the conservatives at well, the end of the, the day employees. that you can't afford these better pensions. Yeah, but uh, no, I, I disagree because it, I, their approach is, is, is different. I mean, their approach with, with the right to work for less uh, a type of laws. And you've got uh, the RAND formula that they, they want to strip away, which, by the way, they're going to probably run into huge constitutional challenge around that. There was a decision just came out two weeks ago, the Bernard decision from Supreme Court of Canada, which reaffirmed the constitutionality of the RAND formula. Just take 30 seconds, remind everybody what that is, the RAND formula. The RAND formula basically uh, uh, prescribes that if even if you are a not a union member, but if you're a part of a bargaining unit, if you work at a workplace which is unionized, then you have to pay union dues because you benefit from uh, any, uh, any uh, agreements that the union was no able to. No free riders. No free riders, exactly. And, and big part and parts on and Bill 64 as well, which I mentioned that the, the conservatives have put forward, uh, takes away uh, that, that particular right. Uh, and there's a huge challenge around constitutionality uh, mm. around that as well. Did you hear a commitment from him just now that um, public sector workers who will be hired in the future will get the kind of pension benefits that you would like to see them get? I don't know if I exactly heard that, but I think there's a recognition that obviously there's uh, negotiated sell settlements that need to take place with employers, if it's the government or a corporation, and with the workers uh, represented by their union, which we believe is the best way. That a negotiated settlement with the parties concerned is always better than being legislated back or being arbitrated if you don't need to do that, because then of course you've got the parties that are in agreement. Even if they, they're not all 100% happy, at least they're negotiating together to come to some kind of resolve. Because when negotiations is all done, everybody has to go back to work. Right. So if you're able to negotiate something together, then at least it's that much smoother inside the workplace. Because that's really our ultimate goal. Despite what Kelly might have said around you know, workplaces and, uh, and meet jobs being lost perhaps with unions, I would disagree with that that there is no goal of any union to say that uh, a company should not be viable, should not be doing well, because then we would just be uh, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot. We want the jobs to stay. We want employers, companies, businesses to be profitable and doing well, because that also means jobs for our members and for families. So uh, we're always trying to figure out different ways, being part of solutions and conversations to come up with things to say, hey, maybe we should look at it in this way or in that way. But at the, at the end of the day, unions don't run uh, the company. Uh, we can always suggest things, but uh, we're not the ones that make the ultimate decisions of a corporate plan, for example. But we always want the, the workplace to, to survive, but we just want a bit more of the share of the pie. The key yeah. is what's the rules of the game, mm -hmm. right? And if you've got a rules of the game for, that allow for that, that respectful, good faith negotiation, collective bargaining negotiations to take place, of course, both sides will have their mandate as they always are, and they'll bring it to the table. I think the essential debate we're having is what happens if you change the rules? Uh, is that balance still in place? Is it going to allow for that good fit bargaining to take place? Well, you say and balance, but of course there's lots of people in this province who think that you guys have got the balance wrong, that you're too deeply in labor's hip pockets, and that the balance, as it were, needs to be moved more to what they would see as the middle. Thus, this new discussion paper from the Conservatives. Uh, and a private balance. member's bill. <laughs> and the private member's bill. All right, speak, can, I, I wanna, can I read a little bit more of you from the star back to you? Uh, you wrote back in September, in an era of increasing competition and constant change, unions need to recognize that the employer's interests in worker engagement are often their own. Not everybody sees that happening. So how do we help make that happen? Well, uh Jenny raised the point of uh, why, uh, why is it that we have uh, people uh, not staying in jobs? Uh, why don't we have more, uh, uh, more people sticking around and that's better for the employer if, uh, you know, if you have people who are trained and, uh, and senior and know how to do their jobs? I think that uh, unions and employers have a shared interest in employee engagement. They are uh, a worker who, who likes their job, will do their job better, uh, they will be motivated, uh, and they will, they will have a better quality of life because those of us who've had to work in a job we hate know that it's, uh, it's not good for your, your life and your, and your health. So I think our job as unions is to, is to look for the well-being of our total employee, which is, of course, their financial, their financial well-being, a fair wage and, and health and safety, but how to 
how to uh, have some um, some feedback mechanism in the workplace uh, so their voice can be heard and how they how they do their job because they often have very good ideas about how their job should be done, but uh, in the hierarchical uh, workplace uh, they don't get heard. So I think there's a lot of um, what we might regard as uh, as soft work, different from the wages and benefits stuff that we can do and be. Uh, uh, an ally of the uh, of the employer for the good of our of our members. Kelly, is it your view that uh, unionized employees want too much of a say in how a company is run? I don't think so, and mm -hmm. I think you know I agree with that. That there there should be more of a say. You know, there's the example. Of, uh, there are examples in other countries of how that's run. Germany is the best known, where they have employer employee councils, which they get get together every year and discuss in great depth. You know, the, the situation for the company and what to do about it. And I think we could definitely use more of that here. It's the fact that it doesn't exist that I, you know, that I think is interesting. Why doesn't it exist? It's because both sides distrust the other so much, and it's because the whole history of, of unions here has been so confrontational. Whether that's the union's fault or management's fault, it's probably a bit of both. They could obviously use it, but I think you have to change that entire mindset before you're going to get there. And, and to do that, I think you have to change, uh, again, the attitude of, of unions, of, you know, Corporate, or corporate leaders are all greedy people who want to take our money away from us. That's not the case. And I think the executives have to recognize that not all unions are out to break the company. Anything you can do in your job to get these two sides talking to each other better? Well, but and I, this is where I'm going to disagree with Kelly is because I don't I don't think there is that kind of um, adverse adversarial uh, adversary or antagonism that exists as you you're suggesting. I, I, uh, Jenny mentioned uniform stats, and it's funny Ontario uh, data is is identical. That 97 percent of uh, of uh, uh, agreements in Ontario are have been able to settle without any labor disruption. That's that's a very remarkable number. Uh, that that the two sides do work together. Of course, it, it negotiations are never easy. And the problem is the three percent can completely disrupt the economy. If, for example, it's the Toronto Transit Commission, let's say. Well, it, it depends on the situation and, and what what level we, we're talking about. But I think you've you've got you've got a system which is he healthy, it is respectful. Uh, really, both sides bring their positions together. One of the things that I do, I mean. Uh, equal parts I meet with unions and equal parts I meet with businesses. Glenn mentioned this this earlier. I don't have businesses coming to me as the Minister of Labor saying, you need to change the rules. You need to uh, look at, uh, you know, right to work for less type of, uh, of, uh, of provisions. Businesses are not concerned about that. They actually are engaged in a, in a, in a healthy way working with unions. Great example is health and safety. In Ontario, we've got one of the one of the uh, really good numbers in terms of reducing numbers of uh, workplace injuries and, and fatalities. As we're doing more work towards putting our focus on prevention, uh, you we're seeing great uh, evidence of work being done both by management and unions together to ensure that their workplaces are productive workplaces because. More healthy workers means companies get to do better and make more money. But if we, you're going to, you just say, you know, when you're talking about balance, which everybody wants, balance and fairness, et cetera, people bringing their positions to the table. I mean, Dalton McGinty and the teachers didn't have the best relationship there for a long time. It was fine as long as, as long as uh, the government was agreeing to what the unions wanted. Uh, once he decided that he had to freeze wages and it was going to be two years and it was going to be a bit, little bit tough, suddenly there were no friends anymore. Suddenly there was no talking at the table. Suddenly it was marches on Queen's Park. I mean, you know, if the government itself can't get along with the unions, how do you expect it to happen in other places? Well, again, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's there was a disagreement in a, in a collective bargaining situation and, and unions have certain, certain rights to, uh, to exercise uh, as to how they're going to, uh, within the law, as to how they're going to exercise uh, those rights. It was interesting in, in that particular instance, as I recall, uh, the, the stoppage of extracurricular uh, activities that we saw, I think the Ontario Labor Relations Board, in the in the end of the day, held that it was it was not lawful. Uh, they found that it was part of part of the duty. So again, this, the checks and balances exist within the system uh, to correct course. Uh, as long as I think we maintain the balance that that exists. We started this conversation a while ago talking about tone and conversation and language. That Kelly said some of the language you said was 80 years out of date. I want to play an ad. Here is an ad that suggests that collective bargaining works. It's from the Canadian Union of Public Employees. Watch the ad, then we'll chat. Roll tape, please. 
So many good things we all need start at the bargaining table. A decent living, time for our children, our parents, a safe place to work, a future to look forward to. When workers and employers negotiate fair contracts, they set standards that improve both union and non-union workplaces and help all Ontario families keep up. Collective bargaining works. We can't let any government take bargaining rights away. A message from QP. Uh, Kelly, that's a long way from we're going to grind those capitalists running dogs <laughs> into the gutter, you know? That, that's, it is. That, that's a, a, you know, quite a sweet, soft sell approach, if you like. Is that the way to go? I don't know about that. I don't know about if you can convince people through advertising. I mean, the federal conservatives spend a lot of money on advertising. I don't know if they've convinced everybody about what a great job they're doing with, with all their spending. So it's fair enough that the unions want to do the same thing, but I, I don't know if the effect's going to be any different. I think people want to see... They want to see benefits, they want to see action, they want to see something that affects them themselves. And I think too often in uh, labor relations now, they, they don't see that. An awful lot of uh, union leaders seem to be interested in bigger things. You know, they're interested in politics, not even Ontario politics, Canadian or international politics. They're off sending, you know, boats to Gaza and stuff like that. And I just think that kind of thing turns people off, and even if it's not fair, it, cre it creates an impression of what unions are about that sticks with people. You know, they think, I'm interested in, do I have to work overtime and how much am I getting, and is my company going to continue to exist? And they're seeing themselves paying, paying dues so that, you know, the union can flood Niagara Falls with workers to like the NDP. I think that puts people off. The tone of the commercial, what'd you think? I think that we are trying to do exactly what you're saying that unions need to do, Kelly, and I would invite you to spend a day with us at Unifor, because maybe you just need to kind of get in deep and see what's happening in the labor movement and in the union. I think we're doing a lot of the things that you're suggesting that we should be doing, the language or even having these conversations that Glenn and both you had agreed to that employers and workers have to do more. The example of workers' councils, for example, in Germany. We are trying to do those things. That's been happening for many, many decades. I just don't think everybody necessarily knows or everyone's busy to be paying attention to all the minutiae details that's happening behind the scenes. So those things are happening and I would welcome you if you want to see how some of these things are taking place in the conversations, come on out. Come to a union mem uh, meeting even. Why not? Get to know us a little bit better. Are you unionized? No. National Post never has been, have they? No, it hasn't been. No, okay. Um, I'll give you my get... number in case you <laughs> In case you want to... Not to get too smart at LK here, but that commercial showed not only a kind of a touchy-feely progressive, if you like, approach to all of this, uh, but it was a pretty diverse crowd in that commercial as well. And uh, your appearance here notwithstanding, we're delighted to have you here today. If you go to the Unifor leadership page on your website, it's pretty white. And I'm wondering whether or not the union movement has done a good enough job reaching out to so-called new Canadians to get them involved. Well, we are doing uh, more and more. I actually think we can always do better again. Uh, the executive board is uh, reflective of our membership, but we're also trying to outdo that membership. So our, our constitution will have seats to ensure that there is diversity reflected, but not just in terms of, uh, of an ethnic diversity, uh, but also we have to look at, after the diversity of the entire country, the sectors that we represent workers in, uh, geographic diversity, so on and so forth. So there's a number of factors that we're very uh, cognizant about trying to ensure that we have that diversity reflected. Uh, we have things in our constitution that also mandates, you know, the percentage of our women uh, workers, our women membership that's part of the union will be reflected as a bare minimum in our national executive board, for example. What is it? Um, we are over uh, 30%, 33%, and we have about 40% on our national executive board currently. Mm. These are people who have to get Still elected. Better than your executive council. Right? And these yes. are not just appointments. Yes. I mean, these are people that have to get elected through their peers, through their other union members. Okay. So it Let is a democratic system as well. Your, uh, what's your background, if I can ask? I'm uh, Mi'kmaq from uh, Western Newfoundland. Okay, so Indigenous Canadian? Yes. Uh, do you see the union movement reaching out to Indigenous Canadians adequately? Uh, no, and, uh, and there are such opportunities here because uh, in fairness, the trades have done very good work. Uh, uh, CUSW is one of our skilled trades uh, unions, have done a lot of work uh, working with uh, Aboriginal youth on uh, a different kind of apprenticeship program um, that takes uh, traditional uh, lifestyles and values and uh, approaches into account. Uh, but on the whole, I think uh, we have not, uh, we have gone to 
uh, Aboriginal workers with uh, our same standard uh, bag of tricks and not uh, being cognizant of who we're talking to. So our, our language has not been um, uh, conducive to, uh, to a, uh, a more successful, successful conversation. But uh, it's, it's, it's starting to happen, particularly on the apprenticeship front. Okay, Let's, we've just got a few minutes left here, and I wonder if we could finish up on this. Uh, it seems to me that politicians, uh, union leaders, get into a lot of trouble when there is a lot of angry words in the news every day, and it really drives people crazy. They just don't, they want, you know, it's a kinder, gentler province, right? We all, can't we all just get along? And when we see this, it's infuriating. Minister Nackvi, do you see a way for unions and the people they represent on one side of the table and management or ownership on the other side of the table to do their business in a more collegial, less confrontational way, which at the end of the day, the hope is, would be more constructive. Is that possible? Well, I think it is possible. I think we see, we see that happening in, in again, in, in many, many, many workplaces, unionized or non-unionized, where, again, people want to make sure that they are, are working and they're doing the job that they're, they're hired to do. And I think that's why our discussion around what the rules of the game uh, game are, are very important. Uh, you need to have rules that uh, respect both sides. You have to have rules which allows for uh, constructive conversations to take place. You need rules that allow for checks and balances uh, so that one side doesn't have the day and, and let, them, that, let them work through. And then you've got Ministry of Labor in the, in the middle to allow for that conciliation, to allow for that mediation if, if something is not working well. Uh, I think that's, that's the essence of collective bargaining. That's uh, the good faith bargaining aspect of it has been recognized by the Supreme Court uh, as well. These are all very important elements and features to make sure that there is a it's a healthy workplace, a workplace that focuses on, on, on the productivity of that workplace and, of course, the workers. Kelly, is there a way to do this in a less confrontational, more constructive fashion? I'm pretty pessimistic, you know, because I think other than government itself, uh, uh, labor unions are probably most, one of the most political organizations there is. And, and politics tends to be nasty, and it's getting nastier every year. And I think one of the reasons it's hard to get people involved in in unions is because they don't want to get involved in the politics. It's the same that goes on in government. Why don't young people want to get involved in, in government? Why don't they follow it? They say, it's just, you know, it's too nasty. It doesn't relate to me. And I think you see the same thing in, in, in labor unions. It's unfortunate, but, but that seems to be they, the way they operate. You know, the people that get on, that, that join them are the ones that feel very strongly, and that tends to produce politics. Jenny? So I think it's kind of interesting because I'm a, a more of the optimist, the half glass full. And folks might say as a trade unionist that we're usually the pessimists. We're usually wanting more and, and saying that the glass is half empty. So it's kind of this role reversal that we're having today. I think that, um, you know, the, we are generally getting uh, along. I do think that similar to what the minister is saying, that we are uh, having respectful dialogue. No, we don't have to agree all the time, but there is respectful dialogue that's taking place. I don't think that our educational systems, like for myself, I never learned about unions at all. I learned about it once I went into work, and I happened to be in a, in a unionized workplace. If I didn't but go I'm into a to unionized workplace... I'm trying to see whether or not there's an avenue here to get away from all the demonization. I hear politicians demonizing union members. I hear union leaders demonizing politicians. And it just doesn't feel constructive. Is there a way around that? So I, I believe that young folks actually have to learn about the unions to start off with. Because if they don't know about it, they go into the union, they have problems then there could be some you know, confrontations if there's issues. I think people need to learn about that. But I do think that politics are an important piece of anybody's life. Uh, corporations and employers are into politics. Yes, unions are in involved in politics because government legislation, or lack thereof, affects people, affects what happens in the workplace. Should it be more uh, positive? I, I would think it, it, uh, it could be more positive. Do we control that? No. That's up to the different candidates that are running. Those are that's up to different political parties how they're running. It could be a lot more positive. Uh, will that change everything in terms of people getting more involved? I don't know. Um, I guess that's something that we all have to try and see. Here's change one the thing channel. I do know: this program's always 60 minutes long, and we've just used them all up. Thanks everybody for coming in tonight. Yasser Nakfi, the Minister of Labor of Labor, not for of Labor, and the MPP for Ottawa Centre. Glenn Wheeler from the Canadian Office and Professional Employees Union. Kelly McParland, editor, full comment, National Post, and Jenny Ahn from Unifor, the newly formed union as of last September. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.